everyone, this is Miff, your life and performance coach, and welcome to the Actually You Can podcast. On this show, we discuss strategies for growth for ambitious individuals so you can spark and initiate your next evolution. You'll hear from inspiring guests who will share their journeys, challenges, and lessons learned. And I'll be sharing insights and actionable takeaways from my Aligned Results Framework that will help you to align your goals, mindset, and strategies to reach your highest potential. Be sure to hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to so you can easily find this podcast again and stay updated with new episodes dropping every week. In today's episode, I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Sammy, a journalist and digital content producer who is a shining example of someone who has managed to turn their passion into a thriving career. Sammy's journey serves as an inspiration for anyone seeking a fulfilling career. Her story highlights the importance of following your passions, embracing your true self, and taking action to turn your dreams into reality. By staying true to herself and maintaining a strong work ethic, Sammy has been able to carve out a successful career in an industry that she loves. So enough from me, let's jump into the show. Thank you so much, Sammy, for jumping on today. It's so lovely to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. It's so lovely to put a face to the name that I've been communicating with these past few days. Lovely. Okay. The pleasure is all mine. And before we jump into, I guess, the, the formalities, the interview side of things for today, I'd love to play a little game with you. Are you down for that? Oh, always. Awesome. So it's a game of this or that. So I'm going to say two things and just to better introduce yourself to the audience, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You'll say which option you would go for. So okay. first, first one, spicy or mild? Mild. Sorry. Beach, <laughs> beach or mountains? Oh, beach. Beach. Sweet or savory? Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> um, oh, sweet, sweet. It is a tough one. I saw dogs. Dogs, easy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Early bird or night owl? Early bird, for sure. Coffee or tea? Tea. Don't drink coffee. Okay, we, we can dig into that. I heard people <laughs> who don't drink coffee is a psycho, so good, good tangent to go on. Awesome. Uh, dancing or karaoke? Dancing. No karaoke ever. Thank you very much. <laughs> Amen. Uh, pizza or tacos? Pizza. Rainy or sunny days? Ooh. Rainy. Rainy's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Road trip or staycation? Road trip. City or countryside? Country. Always. Country gal at heart. <laughs> travel <laughs> around Australia or travel Europe? Oh. I might sound like a bit of a wanker, but I travelled Europe earlier this year with my mum, so I'll go Australia. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. Join the grey nomads in their caravans. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, now we have a little bit more of an insight about your wonderful self. I'll hand it over to you to do a bit more of a formal introduction. Who is Sammy? Gosh, where do I start? Um, I'm a weirdo at heart, so... At the moment, I am working in radio. I'm a journalist, newsreader, and also another part of my job is as a digital content producer at radio stations Mix 96.3 and Hit 104.7. So we're kind of, we're owned by the one company, which is Amplify CBI, and under that umbrella is those two radio stations. I'm really lucky in my job. Um, I also get to work with... Uh, local sports teams, so Brumbies, Raiders, Canberra United, the Caps, you name it. It's really good fun. Um, as part of that this year, especially with the NRLW for the Raiders and them expanding into that competition, I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to work with the girls and call their games with our Raiders on Mixed Call teams. That's also been a part of my job this year. And I also produce um, and host a podcast called Tailored Talk which is all about the pretty things, fashion clothes, beauty, skincare, all the stuff you talk about, you know, over the water cooler or cuppa with all the girls uh, in the kitchen room. So, yeah. And I guess like my side hustle is on the Instagram, on the gram, as my mum, Carol, calls it. Um, 
I kind shout of work with some different brands. Yeah, shout out Carol. We love you, Carol. <laughs> um, yeah, I do some work with local businesses, often say uh, brands like QT will reach out to me um, or local small businesses, which I love um, because I come from a small business background with my family. That's something I'm really, really passionate about. So whether it's a local jewelry designer or even just a, a local cafe or restaurant and they reach out and say, hey, um, come and try our food. And um, I do a bit of promotion on that side of things as well. So. I do a bit of everything. Um, I like to be busy. That's for sure. <laughs> and you can just hear in the voice how you talk about all those things. You're clearly passionate about what you do. And that's why I'm so excited to have you on today to talk specifically to find about how you can actually have a job, whether or not you call it that, that you actually enjoy. I think it's it's often talked about that you need a job that pays the bills. And yes, that that can be true for people for a, a particular chapter of their life. I know I've definitely had one of their jobs. And I also mm. think it's true that you can be paid to do something you actually enjoy doing too. Oh, definitely. For sure. I think it makes work a lot easier if you like a bit of it. Yes. At least in my experience, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you spend so much of your life there too, right? Like if it's eight oh. hours a day that you're like, I just don't like, that's a, that adds up to a fair chunk of your life. <laughs> yeah, and life is too short to do something that you don't enjoy. And I know I definitely learned that from my mum and my dad, particularly my mum. So my mum and dad have got a cafe in Goulburn, so I grew up in hospitality, um, which was also great for learning a very solid work ethic. Some might, some might say, my sisters might say child labor at times, but it was, it was very good for installing a, a solid work ethic, but also learning just people skills and how to interact with anyone from whether they are the richest person in the room to, you know, Joe Blow from down the street. Um, that was a great learning curve, but I think I'm also luckily the kind of person that if I'm busy and I have a job. I, th I think I'm a pretty positive person, so I can I can find the joy in even some of the mundane tasks, as lame as that might sound. <laughs> you do definitely have a very positive and beautifully bright outlook on life, and that helps also when you're working on stuff that you're interested in. You can deal with the mundane sort of things as well when you have that sort of outlook. And so I'm curious, amongst all the things that you do, is there a common thread that interweaves them? Like they might seem a bit random to someone listening to it, but for you, I'm sure they make perfect sense that you do all these things. No, I totally get what you mean. Um, and again, my mum, who is, you know, one of my besties, if not my absolute bestie, will often say to me, you know, you're doing too much. But the common thread that intertwines all of these different avenues within this media industry, and I'm so lucky to be working in this industry, um, is stories of people. I've always, since I was little, um, I have loved, I loved English at school. I loved writing. I loved telling stories. And I think it is such a privilege, particularly in the newsroom. Um, and even with the Raiders teams and this year with the Raiders girls, learning their stories and where they have come from and that we are the avenue by which these stories are filtered through and we get to present it to the wider public. Like we are in such a position of privilege to be able to do that. And I always think that's such an honor. Um, and I never take that part of my job lightly, particularly as a journalist. But yeah, going back to your question, I think the main part is the human element. I get so inspired by people's stories. And whenever someone asks me, you know, what's your favorite new story or, you know, what's your best what was your best part of your day today? And more often than not, I will say it's not necessarily the big juicy news stories. Like don't get me wrong as a journo, you know, I'll start drooling over those, but it's, it is the average Joe Blow down the street who might've been nominated for, you know, um, local hero of the year when it comes around to the Australian of the year awards or um, you know, the local Vinnie's volunteer who's putting together a great big charity bash or whatever it is. It is those people who are out in the community. They're not doing it for fame. They're not doing it to big note themselves. They are doing it out of the goodness of their heart and they are passionate. And passion is, I think, so infectious. And yeah, it's something I could, I could sit and listen to people's stories all day. Um, 
yeah, I think the human element, again, answering your question would be the common, the common thread through all of those. And was there a particular event or p- particular period of your time where you realized that was something of interest to you? Like uh, hearing, you know, you grow up working in, in hospitality in a, in a smaller, I would say Goulburn isn't a small, small town, but it is smaller <laughs> than Canberra. So let's roll with that. Uh, country, call it country as well. Uh, town, I'm, I'm sure that you had the opportunity to connect with a lot of people there. Was it around that time or was it other events that you realized that this was an uh, area of passion for you? Yeah, look. I would what I'm what some people would say is a bit of a late bloomer in the in media, especially in radio. I have friends um, in this building that I work in that have worked in radio since they were 16, and I really didn't find what I wanted to do till a little bit later. So I went through high school. I was such a nerd at school, like total nerd burger. I think back on what I was like and I was like, oh my gosh, I was annoyingly a goody two shoes, you know, like that kid that would sit up the front and was best friends with the librarian, like no joke, that was me to a T. And I think I listened so much to what other people thought I should do, not what I wanted to do when leaving school. So um, because I was a nerd and growing up in a small country town, if you're good at school, you kind of either went, you know, high science uni degree or so like being a doctor or in medicine or something along those lines, or you go and do law. And I was like, well, I was great at English. Um, sorry, that sounds really arrogant, but I was good at English and talking. And I think it's just facts. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I went to law. I hated it. I did not fit in. Um, and I think I was just in a place in my life where I was a bit burnt out from all of the study and all the pressure that everyone puts on you, you know, HSC mm-hmm. for this silly little number that you think will determine the rest of your life. And it's this huge, like, oh my gosh, you have this life crisis, you know, when you're 18 or 19. Um, so long story short, I worked with my mum and dad at the cafe for a few years. And then it wasn't until I remember I had this moment with my best friend Loz and we were packing the drinks fridge at the cafe so she also worked at mum and dad's cafe and we had spoken about um because I have I always had lots of clothes I love pretty things like I can't go anywhere without a bit of bling or you know I love sparkly pair of shoes I'm like like a magpie I love shiny things and she had my best friend Loz had seen online that people had started blogging this was you know this would have been gosh no, eight years ago, 10 years ago, you know, when blogs were really, really big. And she was like, you could do this. You know, I used to spend my pocket money, everything that I earned on, like I'd go to Vinnie's or I'd go to the the local clothing shops in Goulburn and, you know, um, model my outfits kind of around. And it was a bit of a joke that people would be like, oh gosh, you're dressed up. Cause I didn't really go many places. So I'd always just dress up, you know, down the street. Goulburn, you know, down the main street, Auburn Street. And yeah, it was kind of then she kind of got me on the path of like, you you can do other things and the opportunities are still there. And from that point, I started realizing that I needed to go back to my roots and who I was as a person. And something that clicked with me was someone said to me, you know, what did you enjoy as a kid? And I remember sitting there and going, well, I loved dressing up. I loved wearing tutus and pearls, but I also loved writing and I loved, I loved the English language. I loved reading and I loved watching the news. I, to this day, have a huge girl crush on Virginia Hauser. She used to read the ABC news. That was what um, dad would let us watch at night. We went to watch the Simpsons or anything else. It was just ABC news. Um, And then if we were good. I was allowed to watch Kerry O'Brien on the 7 30 report. And it's, yeah, exactly. Oh, Kerry O'Brien. Oh, dear. But yeah. And so at that point, I, I remember saying to myself, oh, I don't, as much as it broke my heart leaving the family business, and there is anyone who is from a family business will know there is always guilt around that. Not, not from your parents, not from your family. It's just inbuilt because. That's, you know, this thing, that this business is a big baby that you've all nurtured and, and made together. 
And yeah, I enrolled at uni, um, at UC for a Bachelor of Journalism, I think it was called at the time. Um, and it was, I think it was the only place locally that I could do journalism specifically, but it's so funny looking back on it now. And I think I thought I, I was so embarrassed because I was 24 years old and I was enrolling as a mature age student. And I remember thinking, oh my God, like, this is so embarrassing. I was so like ashamed that I didn't have my life together, which is total bullshit. Like, you know, uh, who has the, I don't have my life together now and I'm 30. You know, who does? I probably won't when I'm 60. Um, But yeah, so I, I went and enrolled and I did that and yeah, I got to where I am today eventually, but I'm, I'm really glad I, t- I took the leap and I got out of my comfort zone. Otherwise, you know, I might be doing something that I'm not, I wouldn't enjoy as much as what I'm doing today. And I've definitely learned that for me, career is not necessarily about the money side of things. The enjoyment for me counts for a lot more than the monetary side of things, for sure. Yeah. And there's a couple of things on that that I'd love to dig into in a bit more detail. You mentioned that you're entering uni again at 24. And I, I believe that, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, that the quarter life crisis is a real thing. So yeah. it's around like the early twenties <laughs> where you start questioning, like, you're right. Like you've completed school. You s- typically might have a gap year or you go straight to uni following a path that has been essentially laid out for you. I think a lot of people can resonate with that. And then all of a sudden you go, holy shit, I'm not happy or something just doesn't feel yeah. good about this. And a lot of people will either choose to question it or they'll continue to ride the wave and go, well, I signed up for this. I need to keep going. I need to see this through or, you know, but I'm meant to be happy. Why aren't I happy? Like you're doing a law degree. Like, you know, shouldn't you, isn't that what everyone aspires to do, right? Um, I had a similar experience. I I enrolled in science law for the very same reasons. Like you got the grades, why not? (laughs) Nine years later with two different degrees, like I I can say that I didn't stick to that one either. But I think what would you say to someone who is currently in that sort of, I guess, transitional period going through uni and they're just having second thoughts? What would you say to yourself back when you were experiencing those thoughts? Gosh, there's so many things. If I could jump back inside my little head, I think one of the main things would be stop caring about what everybody else thinks. That was one of the main reasons why I went to study law in the first place. I remember it was one of the reasons why I didn't pursue journalism out of the straight out of the gate out of school because um, I did have a careers counselor tell me, and I, they meant well, but looking back, I, I should have stuck to my gut. They said, look, there's not many jobs in media. You've got to look a certain way when you're in media. Um, and to some, you know, I'm not, I'm not the stereotypical tall, very, very thin blonde. So you'd go, oh, well, there's, there's the black mark against your name. And it's, it's kind of moving around that, uh, that barrier that we put over what we do and our actions because of what other people might think. And it's only been the last couple of years. Um, that I kind of have started to realize that so many of my actions, whether I realize it or not, then have been a detriment to me because I have worried about what other people think, when what other people will think, when at the end of the day, they're so worried about what they're doing and focused on themselves. I don't give a shit what I'm doing, you know? Um, And I remember I went to a psychologist once Um, and he said the same thing. It was around this time. And I was kind of like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm so worried. What will people think? And I don't know what to do. And I, and I was also very, so worried about disappointing my family. Um, that was a huge thing. I was like, I'm leaving the business. Um, and again, that was my poor mum will listen to this and she'll be like, oh my gosh, you know, you're making us sound like we put guilt on you. They didn't, they didn't. Carol, if you're listening. Um, it was all this internalized guilt and worrying about what my mum and dad would think without asking them what they would think. At the end of the day, as soon as I asked them, they were like, yeah, go for it. We just want you to be happy. As did the rest of my support system, you know, my friends, my family. And 
I even remember thinking, because I had just joined, I didn't get Facebook till I was like 22, maybe. Like I was a bit late to that side of things. I loved Instagram because it was pretty pictures, much easier. But even that, I remember scrolling through Facebook and thinking, God, look at what all these other people who I went to school with, it's like a bit of a rat race. Like, oh, they're engaged or they've got a good job and they've moved to Sydney or Melbourne or they've just graduated with a law degree. Like they must be doing great. You know, you just see the highlights. So I I think I would definitely say to myself, stop caring what everybody else thinks. Like the world doesn't revolve around you, which I know can come across as a mean thing to say, but it's also a bit of a relief. Like the pressure is off you. Um, I also think I would say take a little less on that same vein of not caring what other people think. Stick to your gut and people are always going to give you their opinions and advice. At the end of the day, you are the person that will live with your decisions and you are also the person who knows you best. Um, I think I went through a time when, especially, you know, you mentioned these kind of midlife crisis or quarter life crisis, not midlife. Gosh, we're not, we're not that old yet. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, quarter life crisis and you seek validation from other people and their opinions and I, in some cases, sought that validation from the wrong people. And it's not that they meant anything, uh, you know, bad for me or it's just that the advice wasn't great at the time. And I know deep down, similar to like when I left school and I went and did law, I knew deep down that I wanted to do journalism. But I shoved that thought down because other people, you know, put their ideas of who they thought I should be or could be on me. And n- not not that they were intending to uh, pigeonhole me at all, but that's what it felt like sometimes. And I've definitely learned in this industry for sure, you can get a little bit stereotyped, as I'm sure you can in end- any industry, particularly as a woman. Um, but, yeah, just... Don't listen to what the other wood ducks say. That's something my dad always says. He's like, don't don't listen to the wood ducks. Don't let the wood ducks win. Just go with your gut. And what's the worst that can happen? You fail and fall on your ass and you get up again. Who cares? Life is too short to worry about what other people think. Some wonderful advice there. And and I really like how you shared that you you wanted to follow a path because you thought that's also what your family wanted for you as well. And I think it I want to take a moment just to really normalize that for the listeners as well is, is that our family is our tribe. And first and foremost, we want to feel safe and accepted in our tribe. And so that the tribe also wants to make sure that you're safe, right? So if your parents are coming across saying, yes, go have that degree, go do that profession. While it might not be the best decision for you, it's coming from a place of pure love and just making sure that you're happy, safe, and that you can live a really fulfilling life. And so it's, I love how you had the courage to have those conversations with your family and, and realize that actually like, they just want me to be happy. Like if I told them what would make me happy, then they would probably be supportive of that. And (laughs) I think a lot of people can resonate with that fear just going, oh, but I don't want to disappoint them. Yeah. And it's just opening up that line of communication. And I'm really lucky in our house. We, if anything, growing up, we talked too much. There was too much communication, too many robust discussions. And, but that's also what I'm so grateful for, because at the end of the day, I felt that I I could go to my mum and dad and be like, Hey, I'm not happy. This is what I'm thinking. And I'm also very grateful and I recognize I'm in a pa- place of privilege that mum and dad, I did have a safety net there mm-hmm. if, um, you know, it didn't work out, whether it was the uni, whether it was job in media, whatever it was that, you know, even now I'm kind of like, well, if I get sacked tomorrow, I'll go make cups of tea and coffee at the cafe and mum would probably love it. <laughs> Actually sounds pretty good. Yes. Is she hungry? And she'd feed me. So I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And I also really liked how you shared that it's almost a relief when you when you take the perspective that the world doesn't revolve around you. 
your world revolves around you. And uh, there's a saying out there that I'm going to butcher, so I might as well just create my own. But it's essentially like if you're in other people's business, then who's in your business? Who's in your world? If you're worrying about what other people are doing or what other people should do, who the hell is looking after your life? Because it's not you. Yeah, I love that. That's so true. And that's the thing. Um, and it was it was a psychologist that said it to me. I, I was in a time where I needed a bit of guidance and a bit of help. Mum was like, go speak to someone. And it's so nice having that kind of objective opinion that can just look at you and be like, yeah, you're thinking too much about everybody else. Focus on you. And at the end of the day, that's also easier. Than just worrying about one person instead of everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And another thing you touched on too was you had your good friend prompt you to look back at what you really enjoyed as a kid to find out, like, I guess what your passions are. And I, I like to look at that angle of questioning to really help people understand, not their purpose. I think you can have multiple purposes, but essentially what makes you fulfilled. So I asked my clients to look back on memories where they felt most uh, proud of themselves or where they were most happiest or where they lost track of time. And so a similar line of questioning. And so I'm interested to hear from you once you realize you like you reconnected with the writing and the English skills and the dress ups and all that sort of stuff. How did you start to turn those thoughts into making them more of your day to day and I guess a living in alignment with what makes you fulfilled? You mentioned you enrolled in journalism. So you started down the career path with that. How else did you start to bring those passions to life? So I started blogging, which sounds so lame if there are Younger people listening, it's like a little personal website where you'd write up little articles and I'd post pictures and uh, I would You mean up... blogs aren't cool anymore? <laughs> oh my God. Oops. <laughs> I wish it's fine. fine. I feel like they've had a resurgence this past year. I'm like, oh, why did I get rid of it? But gosh, yeah, blogging. That was, that was a big thing. So yeah, I started up my own little website. I got business cards of like my Instagram. I just did a bit of hustle when it came to the Instagram and social media side of things. And when I say hustle, that looked like I would get friends and family, in particular, my poor little sisters. I have, I'm one of four girls and I have two younger sisters and I used to, um, rope them into taking photos of me in my outfits. And I recognize even now, um, I can be quite bossy. And very particular when it comes to photos of my outfits and how things are done. So those poor girls looking back, even my dad, bless him, he used to take photos. I had this one spot that I loved taking photos of my outfits of. It was in front of our shed out at Goulburn at their property. And dad used to take a pillow out because I liked a lower angle. And because dad, bless him, he's 70 years old now, but this is, you know, a few years back, but got like he played rugby growing up so he's got croaky knees and he's take out a pillow and he pop it on the ground so that he could kneel down to get the correct angle for me which I like to make my legs look longer any girl who you know takes photos for the gram will know that um so yeah I took photos of my outfits I started posting I reached out to lots of people and I also found um the Instagram side of things once I started growing my following and I was very lucky it grew pretty steadily over three or four years. Uh, and that, that was also integral for networking within the media industry here in Canberra. So even through my journalism degree, there were instances where I could use my Instagram connections that I had created through, you know, posting these pretty pictures of my tutus and my shoes and my hairdo, whatever it was, um, for an Instagram, uh, for a university project or an interview. Um, so it definitely lent itself those two worlds kind of collided. Um, and then ultimately it kind of led to in my second year of university, I was studying full-time and we had to do a, an internship. And so part of being a journalist, I think you have to be a bit pushy and I've always been, um, a squeaky wheel. <laughs> I love Some that. Like, um, yeah. So I remember I printed out a bunch of resumes. I put everything down on there. And I just knocked on doors around Canberra at local media organizations. And that was also, I was just looking for volunteer work. Um, unfortunately, the reality in the media industry is there is not a lot of jobs. Um, and it is quite competitive 
especially kind of when it comes to news and presenting the news. And I was kind of like, well, I've just got to work my way up. And I remember I knocked on the door at, which was then Canberra FM. So Mix 106.3 and Hit 104.7. I went in with my resume and I said, look, you know, I'll just, I'll do anything. I just want to be in the building. I want to be in the space. And they said, look, uh, we don't have any kind of internships going, but we've got a job in the Hit Squad. So if you don't know, if you're not a Canberra local, the Hit Squad, or it used to be called Black Thunder. So I was oh, one of those yeah. kids that, yeah, you drive around and you give out the Free Raiders tickets, Brumbies tickets, and you do a little kind of crossover to Nige or whoever is on the radio at the time. Um, and you're kind of like, hey, it's Sammy, I'm down here at Lineham Shops and I've got free chippies and lollies and some Raiders tickets for this game's weekend. Like, come and see me. Um, gosh, I thought I was so cool. So I did that job for a little bit. Um, yeah, so that was definitely kind of putting it into action, was going out there and, and putting myself out there and not being afraid of people saying no. I kind of learned that very, very quickly. Again, like I mentioned earlier, what is the worst that can happen? You know, if you do go out and you put yourself out there, whether it is a resume or an email, at the end of the day, you've put your name out there. If nothing happens, at least you're on their radar. So if a future opportunity comes up, they know you're keen as a bean and you're available. And I do think there is some value. Um, as much as I love technology, I do think there is still some value on going face to face. So if you can, going with a paper copy of your resume, as well as emailing it, going out and meeting people, you know, shaking their hand, getting a nice smile on and being like, hey, this is me. This is what I can offer. And also, if that's the kind of front that you present to just their front of house, that's the kind of persona that they know they will get if you're dealing with customers or clients. Um, and yeah, so I guess, sorry, I kind of waffled on a bit there, didn't I? But that's kind of what I did to get into um, the media industry and start doing what I, what I loved and what I was really passionate about. And I'm really lucky that I get to do it. First of all, I want to say Hit Squad people were cool back when yes. in my day. Like I remember being like, how cool is that? They get to drive around and give out free shit. So I'm going to call you up on that. You are definitely cool. Um, <laughs> and I love what you said in regards to a physically walking around handing, handing out your resume because I completely agree. It really helps to have that human connection. And also you're really, you're hard to ignore when you're standing in front of someone, right? Like mm -hmm. it's really easy to ignore an email or to go to junk or be like the 50,000 other emails that person is probably getting. What's going to make you different is if you and it actually show up and show your uniqueness in person. I think that's such wonderful advice. And I also really appreciated how you said you were willing just to do anything to get into the building. And I'm not sure about you, but I often hear, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I don't want to generalize the next generation. Oh, God, I feel so old saying that. Um, <laughs> but people coming up looking for entry-level jobs. But I often hear that people's expectations of uh, jobs straight out of uni or their first jobs are so much higher in terms of pay or just what they're expected to do. I'm not sure if it's social media that's that's showcasing, you know, I can earn a million dollars in a year through an online business or something like that. But I'd be curious to hear your thoughts and perceptions of, I guess, people's willingness to literally do whatever it takes to get in the door, whether it's mopping floors or just volunteer work. Do you think people are as eager to do that as they were back in back in our day? <laughs> I definitely agree with you. I was literally having this conversation um, in a in the car with my mate today. We're on to on our way to a business lunch, and we were just talking about how, gosh, it does make me feel old when I say it. But the younger generations, there was just there's no oomph, there is no gumption there. Like I remember being so keen in my first. Gosh, my first year in the newsroom, I did so much overtime and I look back on it now. At the time I was living in Goulburn still with my mum and dad, just because I was back at uni and uh, money wise, that kind of just, it was easier and more financially um, sustainable. And I was studying full time and I was working full time 
and somehow maintaining my Instagram uh, persona, whatever you want to call it, the gram, the blog. Uh, and But I loved it and I wouldn't have done it any other way. And I was so tired. But because I was so enthusiastic about what I was doing and I was so keen and grateful to be just learning and and soaking up as much as I could from all these people around me who had much more experience and still do have so much more experience than I do in this industry, I would have done anything, like you said, mop the floors. And I, I think there is also something to say about the respect around that as well. I do find like we had this, oh, we had a poor intern, must have been oh, months ago, and they made the remark that they'd had to stay half an hour late in the newsroom one day. And they just obviously did not read the room because a bunch <laughs> of us were sitting around for a cuppa and then they, they're whinging about, oh, I had to stay half an hour late. And we all just kind of giggled. Like we didn't know what to say. We're like, well, welcome to the newsroom, buddy. It's 24-7. And if you're not the kind of person that gets a bit of a sick kick out of it, then you're in the wrong industry. Um, and it's also, unfortunately, being in the media industry, if we want to earn a mozza, you've got to be Kyle and Jackie O, um, you know, or settle for what we are given, which, you know, if you want to earn a lot and lot and lot of money, you've got to be the absolute best of the best or go work in another industry, you know, go work for a hedge fund. Um, we do this because we love it. And like I said, it is such a privilege to tell people stories and I think unfortunately that enthusiasm and that attitude is not something you can teach I think you've either got it or you don't and I do think that's partly your upbringing and how your you know your family I know I have gosh I have friends and I look at them like I adore them as friends but when it comes to work and I go we have such different ideas of like you know and I'm sure you do I have friends that I love and adore, but if I ever had to work with them, I'd probably kill them. Like my work ethic, and again, that's like thanks to my mum and dad, sometimes it's a bit too much and I'm too hard on myself, but I definitely know that that's why today I'm able to do what I do. I can come into work every day and as lame and cheesy <laughs> and ugh, as it sounds, I do love what I do. So it doesn't feel like work a lot of the time. And don't get me wrong, there are definitely elements when I, you know, you've got to answer emails or I've got to do a audit of some of our data for a social media or whatever. And I go, oh, numbers, yuck. But the majority of things, oh, it's bloody good fun. And that is, without sounding arrogant, because I've got that oomph. And I can say that confidently. I've got the gumption, I've got the work ethic, and I do think you're right. I think that's something that, unfortunately, you can't teach. So it is, I think that kind of attitude is a bit old school and is missing a little bit from the younger people that are coming through, younger than us. I mean, we're still young, but the younger ones. Yeah, at heart at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah good, good. <laughs> Hearing you talk about that as well, like I, I've, I can definitely resonate a lot with what you're sharing and I often get the comments, oh, you work way too hard or, or they're not paying you for that. And I was like, yeah, I get it. Like, I, I'm not sure if it's simply for legalities or, or, you know, we have a society where work hours are nine to five and I'm doing air quotes because we're both probably just laughing going, what's a nine to five work day? <laughs> yeah. right? And so I think like when you get hired into jobs and you go, yep, you get paid for a 30 hour work week. I think they just have to say that. I know I've rationalized it with myself and I feel better about being able to give the effort that I want to give by just going, I get this salary to produce a particular outcome and it's up to me how long I spend doing that and they're, they're rewarding me for that. And if I enjoy it and I want to invest more, great, but there's no expectation that they're going to pay me more for that because I've gone, this is how much I get paid and what what that means, the value that I give to myself and, and that work is, is dependent on me. If you want a clock in and clock out job, there are plenty of those. Go get one yes. of that, one of those. But I think for the reality, most jobs or ones that are aligned with people's deepest passions. So if you are looking for a job that is deeply fulfilling, which it sounds like you have, it's not cheesy at all. It is possible. 
then you also, I think, need to challenge the mind frame of, of a job is a nine to five clock, clean, clock in, clock out. And you need to get some sweat equity. Yeah. And I do also think you speak there about passion because I am passionate about what I do. Oh, sorry. That's my end. If you are passionate about what you do and you love your job, going over the nine to five isn't an issue. It's not, it's not because I'm grinding away. It's because I lose track of time, you know, or I'm interviewing someone and their story is so good, or I'm re-listening to an interview on a podcast that I've done. And, you know, it's, it's, it's cause I love it. It's not because I'm like, oh gosh, you know, I've got to stay half, half an hour later or, you know, an hour later, like Lordy, Lordy. Um, no, it's cause I, it's cause I bloody love it. And you know, I probably, that's how I want to spend my time. If anything, you know, and the telly at home and my beautiful little doggo, they'll still be waiting for me at the end of the day. What's your dog's name? His name is Tino. It is short for Valentino. <laughs> there you go. That makes complete sense. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of comments that I hear as well as pe- and sounds like you get similar is people go, oh my God, you're so busy all the time. And almost when I hear the word busy, I sort of repel and pull back because I think in society, the word busy have such, has such negative connotations to it. I'm like, yes, my life is full, but I fucking enjoy everything that I do. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. So I almost feel like, why are you calling me busy? It's almost implying that I'm doing shit that I don't want to do. I'm almost insulted. (laughs) Totally. And I don't know about you, but I I feel like you're this kind of person as well. And I, it's maybe it's a genetic, a genetic thing. Cause I know my mum. I think I get this from my mum and my dad to an extent as well, but I get this sick adrenaline kick out of being thrown in the deep end or doing something that is a challenge and it tests me, puts me to my limits and then coming out, being spat out at the end, you know, even if I look like a dog's breakfast and I've just survived, but I can look back and go, I did that. Like I bloody did that. And I, I survived. I did okay. You know, everything's all right. The world will move on as it did. Like I, yeah, I really thrive on that. And I think that's a huge part of why I do enjoy this industry as well is because we are constantly put in situations, whether it's, it might be something as simple as uh, interviewing a sports player who's not very good in front of the camera and you've got to crack them and make them laugh or, or even, you know, if go to extremes like bushfires or the COVID pandemic and making sure that people get the information that they need to get through their day. And that the pressure is on you. If you fuck that up, then literally in some cases, people's lives are at stake. Not that we are saving lives. You know, we're not, we're not uh, doctors or the AMBOs or any of nurses or any of those amazing people, but the challenge of those scenarios to this day, I look back and whenever anyone asks me, you know, what was your kind of your favorite experience working in radio? I will always go the most rewarding but also challenging experience, which I loved, was those, you know, those summer bushfires and during COVID and the fact that you just got to learn on the go, you, it's sink or swim. And I, yeah, I love that nature of it as well. Yeah. And it sounds like, I mean, people, there's kind of two angles to this as well. People say that you need to know your strengths, but also work on your weaknesses. I'm sort of under the more impression that if you want to be truly fulfilled in what you do, it's, it's you need to know your strength and work on your strengths, be acutely aware of your weaknesses, get them to an area where they don't sabotage you or delegate to areas <laughs> um, where you need to. But essentially, if you, if you want to be deeply fulfilled, then really leaning into your strengths can help create that. And it sounds like your strengths are, are creating those sorts of memories for you as well, being able to tell people's stories or, or communicate those really important events. I mean, going through those, those pandemic, the uh, COVID pandemic or going through the bushfires, it's, you mentioned that you're, you're not saving lives. And again, I'm air quoting here. I should stop doing that on a podcast. Um, <laughs> but, but the stories that you're sharing are impacting lives because we're relying on people such as yourself to be able to make sense of what's going on, to make sense of the world, to create a sense of security and safety. So it's really cool to see that 
uh, that your strengths is is also having such a beautiful impact on the world. And I think that goes for everyone. If you really take the time to identify what those strengths are and really lean into and start to leverage them, you'll find that you will have such a beautiful, positive impact on this world as well. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful way to put it, Miss. And I think, as you said, you hit the nail on the head when you said play to your strengths. And it's every, it's not comparing yourself to anybody else. There are people in this, in this industry that I work in and they are way more experienced, much smarter. They're, you know, got many more strengths or different strengths than what I have, but I know my strengths. And so I know when I come to a situation, what I can contribute. And also when I work within a team, how I can fit into that team. Um, the perfect example of that is I do a bit of digital work um, at Mix 106.3 and Hit 104.7. And when I joined that digital team, I was kind of like, oh my God, why are they putting me in here? I not, you know, I didn't know any of the fancy fan dangle video editing programs, anything like that. I was good on the gram and I'm good with people, I think is safe to say, but that's the element that I, I brought. And to this day, we are great as a team because they recognize that and I recognize that. And we use those strengths. So yeah, not comparing yourself to other people as well. Um, and yeah, as you said, stick to your strengths and bloody own them. You can't get that saying, can't get much more Australian. I love just, just bloody own them. That's really great. <laughs> and you've already yeah. shared such wonderful words of wisdom and, and advice to the listeners. And so I'm really keen to hear as well, what's a really actionable step someone could do in the next 24 to 48 hours if they want to start that journey to finding a career that they really love? I think it would be that little bit of advice. Um, and I got it from a beautiful customer who um, I used to serve at my mum and dad's cafe. And it was go back to what you enjoyed as a child. And I think lots of us forget that. I think we get so swept up in what society expects of us and, you know, what is the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do or, or what you think other people want you to do, whether that is your family or your friends or these expectations um, that are built around you. Um, yeah, sit down, get out, you know, a piece of paper or your journal or go through some old family photo albums. I think so many of us, because we are so busy, I mean, lots of us are so busy, um, you know, hustling and, and making the money to, you know, pay for the rent and everything else at the moment, that it's sometimes hard to find a moment to prioritize just sitting down and think about what you love doing as a kid, you know, and I'm sure like for you, it's probably, you know, sport and you're very active, like, and, and and loved people like and that's something I just remember yeah that was integral in me kind of redirecting what my life path was really mm -hmm. I sat down after a few chats with that beautiful customer who um yeah such great advice and my bestie Loz and I was kind of like okay like how can I how can I do this I sat down with pen and paper and I still have the I had this little diary that I used to draw kind of outfits and things in it and even opening that up and I was like oh okay so that's a start but I remember game game planning this is what I loved and it was just even like a little mind map like a little mind map brainstorm that they would get you to do in school and in just brainstorm what you loved as a kid and how that would translate into something that you could do now and obviously I realized that there are practical things that you need to take into consideration like money and, you know, if you've got family that you've got a support or a partner and kids, all that kind of thing. But I think the key point that I've found, you know, throughout the past 10 years and going to uni and, you know, learning, working in media is I love this industry because of who I am innately as a person. And if you are in an industry like I was, like, so I was in hospitality, um, and don't get me wrong, I loved connecting with customers over the counter and hearing their stories, but I realized that hearing their stories while I was serving them was the most exciting part of my day. And so, yeah, recognizing what you enjoy most and going back to those, those roots of your childhood 
you know, if, if you were a sporty soul or maybe you were creative or there was something that you used to do that you really enjoyed that you don't do anymore. And even if it's not necessarily in a career sense, but just to fulfill yourself, like if, if you used to paint and you don't paint anymore, why don't you paint, you know, and then even just like go to Kmart, get yourself some paints and a scrapbook and just do it one night or on the weekend. Like it doesn't have to be this huge step. It can be baby steps. Um, cause if for anything, like I know that it can be so daunting, um, but yeah, just st stay true to yourself. You know deep down what you love and enjoy. And if you if you don't, you've lost yourself a little bit, then go back through the photo albums. Ask your mum and dad. Um, yeah, go back, go back to those childhood roots. I think that would be my little kind of practical advice for now. Just just mic drop and there. That was great. I was gonna say, maybe skip through the awkward. <laughs> photos where you've got like no front teeth and stuff but I'm like no no sit with that because that is the age where you probably that's, started giving up on those passions 100 percent, they are the best years you're probably having a lot of good times there that you didn't care that you didn't have two front teeth so <laughs> sit with those photos 100 yeah, percent. ask that little person what was going on then what made them happy because that's probably what's going to make the little person within you happy today as well yeah well thank you so much Sammy for sharing that I really, really appreciate uh, you coming on today and for sharing all of your experience with us. You can change your course of your life at any moment. And I hope that people will use the power of the conversation that we've had today to influence the course of their life if they're not feeling that they're on track. So thank you so much. Oh, me, thank you. It's been so lovely chatting with you. And I hope, I hope your listeners enjoy this chat as much as I did. Thank you so much. And so I'll put links to, I was going to say your blog, but um, you've said you've deleted that. If, if you do resurrect that, I would love to link to your blog in the show notes. I'll let you know. But where else can listeners find out more about you? Oh, sorry, Miff. I couldn't quite hear you on that end bit. Uh, no worries. And, yeah. and so if listeners are interested in finding out more about you, where can they do that? So just find me on the gram. I am at Sammy's D Rose. That is my main port of call. You'll see um, lots of pictures of my dog, lots of food pictures and lots of pretty clothes. So if you are a sparkly shoe enthusiast like I am, please come along and join me. Sounds great. I'll put those dates in the show notes too. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining me today for another episode of the Actually You Can podcast. I so enjoy having you here and I hope you've taken away powerful insights and tools that will support you to achieve your high level results. Now, before you go apply all of this wisdom in your life, I'd be so grateful if you are able to leave us a podcast review on the platform that you're listening to or share this episode with a friend. Your support means that we can help more self-led, high-performing individuals just like you expand what's possible for them. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. So please, go on and shoot me a note on socials and let me know what you think. You can find me on Instagram at Miff Galloway. Now, go ahead and make those dreams a reality because actually, you can.